Hello, and welcome to this tutorial. Today we're covering audio input monitoring. What is input monitoring? In short, it routes incoming audio through band in a box and back out to your speakers or headphones, which allows you to hear the audio while you're recording or practicing. There are a couple ways this is useful. First and probably foremost, it's very common to wear headphones when recording with a microphone. This is so the microphone doesn't pick up the sound from your speakers and cause a feedback loop, which you may have experienced in the past as an awful squealing or howling sound. It sounds something like this. But at lower levels, it can add an unwanted echo or a weird change in frequency response. Using headphones like I am right now can eliminate that. You should look for closed back headphones as they have better isolation. Unfortunately, there is one significant downside to using headphones in that the headphones often block the sound of your voice or instrument from reaching your ears, making it more difficult for you to hear while recording. And not being able to hear means you might hit the wrong note or play at the wrong time. Audio input monitoring allows you to hear yourself, making it possible to capture your best performances more consistently. Thankfully, enabling audio input monitoring in Band in a Box is very easy, and I'll show you how to do that. First things first though, make sure your speakers are turned down or off. This is very important to avoid being deafened by feedback. Once you've made sure your speakers aren't about to shatter your eardrums, we can continue. Make sure the mixer is visible by clicking on the mixer tab in the toolbars in the upper right of the window. Alternatively, you can open the mixer from the window menu under floating mixer window, or you can press Control shift m Next, choose a track. In most cases, you should choose the audio track or one of the utility tracks, but it doesn't really matter which one as long as it's not being used by anything else. I'm going to use the audio track. Above the track controls, where you can mute, solo, and freeze the track, you'll see a VU or volume meter. This is the part that lights up when sound is playing. Right click or two finger click on that and the input monitoring menu will pop up. Simply click on arm track, that's it. You'll notice that the VU meter is now highlighted in blue. This is to let you know that input monitoring is enabled on that track. To disable input monitoring, simply repeat the process. Right click and uncheck arm track. Now once you enable input monitoring, you may notice that your voice or instrument is only playing from the left or right side. This is because most microphones, as well as many instruments, are mono, while the input monitoring defaults to stereo. To fix that, right click on the VU meter again and choose either mono left to stereo or mono right to stereo. Which one you choose depends on which side the sound is coming from. And that's basically it. However, there's one more thing I'd like to mention that, in my opinion, makes this even more powerful. In short, it's possible to use effects while using input monitoring. This can be used for a few things. Firstly, when recording vocals, it can be nice to add an effect or two. In particular, I like to add a little bit of reverb when recording vocals. It can make the recording sound a bit more polished, which can help capture better vocal takes as it can subconsciously make you feel a bit more confident while performing. Using the tone control can also help, particularly if your microphone is either a bit bright or a bit dark sounding. Higher numbers make the sound brighter, while lower numbers make the sound darker. Going a step further, it's actually possible to use audio plugins instead of or in addition to the built-in reverb and tone controls. To add a plugin to your track, go to the Plugins tab on the mixer. Then on the track you want, click on one of the four plugin slots and choose a plugin from the list. This is fantastic for those of you who plug your guitar directly into your audio interface as you can add some distortion or tremolo. Here's what that sounds like. And now, with the band. Now, if 
you're having some trouble with your sound, it's time for some troubleshooting. First off, you might be wondering why you're not getting any sound. So the obvious things to check would be to make sure your cable and microphone are connected properly, and try a different cable if you have one. Make sure your interface is getting a signal. On most of them, there are lights that show you when a signal is being received. Now, one thing you may not know is that some microphones require power. Typically, these are condenser microphones, and they usually require you to turn on phantom power from your interface. On this focus right, it's the 48 volts button. Now, something to be careful about here is that most microphones will either use or ignore phantom power, but some can actually be damaged by it. So if you're not sure, you should consult with the manufacturer of the microphone to make sure that it is one that will accept or at least ignore phantom power. Now, if your interface is getting a signal, but it's not getting into Band and Box, you'll want to go to the main audio preferences in Band and Box, which is in the Options menu, under Preferences, then Audio. First, you'll want to select the audio driver type. Typically, when recording, you should use ASIO, which stands for Audio Stream Input Output, or WAS, which stands for Windows Audio Session. The third option here, MME, should only be used as a last resort, as it typically creates a high amount of latency. This is the amount of time it takes for the interface and your computer to process the sound coming out of your instrument, as well as the audio being played back, and it can cause a delay in your recording. Once you select the audio driver type, another window will pop up asking you to select an audio device. Make sure to select the one that corresponds to your hardware. In my case, it's the Focusrite one. If you have an interface with more than two input and output channels, you should select which channels you're using in the lower section here. In my case, the interface is two in and two out, so the defaults will work fine. Now, a quick note about ASIO. In many cases, ASIO drivers run in an exclusive mode. This means that only one program can use a sound card at a time. If you have any trouble using Band in a Box with ASIO, just make sure that you're only running one audio program at a time. This can even include your browser, so just save those cute cat videos for later. I know you love them, I do too. For this reason, we typically recommend only using ASIO when you're trying to get audio into Band in a Box, because under most other circumstances, the latency doesn't matter. While we're here, if you click on the ASIO driver's control panel button, the control panel for your interface will come up. This is different for each device, but typically there will be a control for buffer size. This is a very important control as it can determine the amount of latency while recording. Lower numbers here provide lower latency, but will also increase the likelihood of audio glitches as the audio buffer is meant to prevent that. This is something that you should really play with to find the best results for your computer and interface. For me, the default was set to 192, and that seems to work quite well on this computer. Either way, once you've selected your device, click OK back to the main screen of Band in the Box and press play to make sure you can hear it. Remember, when using an audio interface, the sound will be coming out of whatever's connected to the interface, not the speakers built into your computer. And that brings us to the end of this tutorial. If you have any questions or you run into any problems, feel free to contact our tech support team. They're available by phone, email, and online chat, and they would be happy to assist. Either way, keep on keeping on, and as always, have fun!